Well, I'm back. Been dealing with a lot of flack lately, but I ponied on up anyway and thought I'd make a video. I, I can't leave you guys suffer anymore. Here's another one. Despite YouTube's craving attempts to silence me and ghost my channel. In today's dose, I'm going to change things up a little bit for you. Keep everyone guessing, you know what I mean? I'd usually deliver a digital tome of any one of a million amazing ass kickers. But in this video, I'm going to focus on a machine of legend. The first one I've ever done. And it's a noble creature. A flying slice of American pie dolloped in a heavy dose of Americana. A beautiful winged beast of lore and the sexiest thing to have ever flown. We're talking about the F-14 Tomcat, baby. I didn't think to put my daughter in uh... I don't care what other people think. Really was coming from my face, here and there. Never in the field of human conscious was so much owed by so many to so few. By the content of that character. Where did we get such men? At the going down of the sun, we will remember them. The Grumman F-14 Tomcat is an American supersonic, electronic, twin-engine, two-seat, twin-tail, variable sweep-wing fighter aircraft and star of the delightfully camp but cool in the old-school movie, Top Gun. No, you ain't getting a topless volleyball scene in this video, so you just relax the cats there, home slice. Jesus Christ! The F 14 was a big unit, and I mean big. Just take a look at her next to the skinny jean F 18 Hornet. Now that's the difference between a man and a boy, right there, fellas. One was built for war, while the other just wants to pose as war playing on Instagram. Initially driving this big bird or two Pratt and Whitney TF 30 P 412A or JTF 10A augmented turbofan engines, each rated at 20,900 pounds of pure trust which blasted the aircraft to a blistering speed of Mach 2.34. Blowing hair back better than a turbocharged Knight Rider on a jump scene. I don't know as bad as Airwolf, but then again nothing is. Part of the reason why the plane was so big was so it could accommodate the enormous and phallic AIM-54 Phoenix missile, or a combination of AIM-7 Sparrows and AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles. The Phoenix missile was enormous compared to most of its peers. It was designed for a long-range delivery of high-power boom powder. The range of the Phoenix missile was a staggering 100 miles, or 160 kilometers, meaning it could be fired before you ever even popped up on an enemy scope. The Tomcat was built to fill a need, a need for speed. Although fast, the Tomcat was Grumman's answer to a question that the US Navy posed all the way back in the 1950s. How can we protect our carrier battle groups from long range missile attacks launched by Soviet bombers and subs? The brass wanted a high endurance long range interceptor that was versatile and capable of carrying heavy payload. It was also vital that it possessed a better radar system and longer range missiles. Grumman offered up the Tomcat as a solution in 1967. The Navy said, show us what you got, and the legend was born. What would become known as the F-14 Tomcat replaced the F-4 Phantom II as the primary interceptor for fleet defense in 1974. Both planes were comparable in terms of length, but the F-14 was larger and heavier plus faster with a greater rate of climb. Let's not forget it could carry several big boy Phoenix missiles as well. The Tomcat was the largest and heaviest fighter to operate off of an American aircraft carrier. The preceding concept of the F-111 was heavier but it never operated off of a carrier due to the damning testimony of the Tomcat's namesake, Admiral Thomas F. Connolly, who upon flying the experimental plane noticed several problems in regards to its suitability as a carrier operator. Primarily that it was too heavy and flew like a brick at low speeds. The F-14 was called Tom's Cat in development in reference to this incident. At slow speeds with its wings spread out the Tomcat looked like a prowling American Eagle, especially when coming in to land on a carrier. But when it hit supersonic speeds those variable sweep wings folded back into a delta wing formation and that bird tore through the skies like an angry angel. With both engines on afterburn the Tomcat could accelerate to over Mach 2. But those engines were thirsty, so it couldn't stay up there for very long. Although built to blow its adversaries out of the sky at a distance and carry a heavy payload farther than other aircraft of its type, the Tomcat was capable of flying up close and personal as well. She was a capable dogfighter, and in the hands of a skilled pilot, that sweep wing technology could be used in conjunction with alternating thrust from either engine to get in tight and bring the nose on target in a blink. 
The Tomcat began its service aboard the USS Enterprise in September of 1974 and participated in Operation Frequent Win during the American withdrawal from Saigon, South Vietnam. The aircraft recorded its first kills during Navy service on the 19th of August 1981 over the Gulf of Sudra in what was to become known as the Gulf of Sudra Incident. Big shocker there. It turns out the two Fu-22 fitters decided it would be a good idea to fire on two US F-14 Tomcats. The Tomcats evaded the missiles fired by their Libyan attackers and returned fire, splashing both bogies using Sidewinder missiles. The F-14 would bag a further two bogies on the 4th of January 1989 when two Libyan MiG-23 floggers attacked over the Gulf of Sidra once again. Since thankfully there was no world war during its period of service, the F-14's first long-term combat use was as a photo reconnaissance platform. Tactical Airborne Reconnaissance Pod System, or TARPS for short, was developed and installed on the Tomcat in 1981. The Tomcat at the time was still not capable of ground strike or bombing missions, hence why the Marine Corps hadn't changed over from the Phantom II when the Navy did but it wouldn't be long before the plane was upgraded to allow these types of missions. The unexpectedly high demand for tarps led to the development of sensors such as the KA-93 Long Range Optics, or LORAP, and the high likelihood of encountering SAM missiles led to the adoption of an expanded chaff adapter that was installed on the Phoenix rails. Radar detectors were also mounted in pairs in the forward cockpit to detect SAM radar, such as the SA-6, to increase survivability when it came to ground-to-air encounters. In the 1980s, the US Navy began flying daily missions over Lebanon to monitor the developing situation in the Beka Valley. At the time, there were concerns that the Tomcat was too big and vulnerable to operate over hostile territory, considering the serious AAA and SAM threats that were present. So the air crews developed high-speed tactics at medium altitudes to negate these threats. By the time the Gulf War rolled around in 1991, many of the bugs in the Tomcat had been learned out before it participated in Operation Desert Storm. The F-14's role in the campaign consisted of combat air patrol or CAP missions over the Red Sea and Persian Gulf. Over land, the aircraft carried out aerial recon and strike escort missions, but inland air superiority operations were usually left to the F-15 Eagle due to the strict ban on the out of visual range weapons in line with the rules of engagement. Roughly translated, this means that the F-14 couldn't use its Sparrow or Phoenix missiles, pretty much pulling all of its teeth. And also, as soon as the Iraqi aircraft were lit up by the Tomcat's powerful AWG-9 radar, they'd soil their britches and go running for mama. It was during the Gulf War that the US Navy suffered its only ever F-14 loss due to enemy action, when on January 21st, 1991, an F-14 was shot down by an SA-2 surface-to-air missile while on an escort mission near Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. Both crews survived the ejection, but only the pilot was rescued by USAF Special Forces, while the Rio was captured and held prisoner by Iraqi forces until the end of the war. The Tomcat's final kill also came at the end of the war when one shot down an MI-8 helicopter with a Sidewinder air-to-air missile. In 1995, the F-14 played a critical role in Operation Deliberate Force, which was a NATO mission to undermine the army of Republika Srpska during the Bosnian War. By this time, the Tomcat had the capability to strike ground targets. Operation Desert Fox would follow in 1998, and then Operation Allied Force in 1999, which involved the bombing of Yugoslavia during the Kosovo War. On October 7, 2001, F-14s would lead some of the first strikes into Afghanistan, kicking off Operation Enduring Freedom with a bang. The plane was able to employ its recent update of the JDAM, or Joint Direct Attack Munition, on the 11th of March, 2002. A JDAM is a guidance kit that converts unguided bombs, or dumb bombs, into all-weather precision guided munitions. F-14s would also participate in Operation Iraqi Freedom. The final American F-14 Tomcat mission was completed on the 8th of February 2006 with the landing of two Tomcats in the US Roosevelt after one had just dropped a bomb over Iraq. The US Navy decided to retire the F-14 in 2006 due to some shenanigans from that dodgy devil Dick Cheney. Apparently Dick, apt name, got into an altercation with the CEO of Grumman at a party before Cheney became Secretary of Defense. Cheney always held on to that grudge and one of the first things he did when he got into power was to end Grumman's contract with the US military, effectively ending the Tomcat for good. Cheney claimed that the F-14 was a hog for resources and was unreliable and impractical, 
It cost too much to operate and had several problems in regards to its long-term use. Dick regarded Grumman as a jobs club, never once mentioning to the American people that Grumman employed 80,000 American taxpayers. Added to this issue was the offered F-18 Super Hornet, which would be cheaper and easier to maintain, even though it was crappy. Little Dick did it for revenge, plain and simple. Apart from the stinging fact that so many Americans lost their jobs, was the added insult that in the works were plans for the Super Tomcat 21, which was a proposed plan to radically upgrade the F-14 to come more into line with the modern day fighters and vastly surpass previous standards. Hence the name, Tomcat 21, as in the 21st century. The Super Tomcat 21 would have been so advanced that it would still be in service today and still have the edge over other fighters. One of the first proposed redesigns was the notoriously problematic glove vanes located on each wing route on previous models of the F-14. They were intended to extend the high speeds which would push the nose of the aircraft down and allow the tail planes which would have allowed for greater maneuverability at speeds of over Mach 1.4. If you're wondering why you never saw these extended on an F-14 before, especially in the movie Top Gun, that's because they had all been welded shut since apparently the things were a maintenance nightmare. On the Super Tomcat 21 and its proposed attack version called the Attack Super Tomcat 21, these would have been replaced by enlarged aerodynamic gloves that offered incredible benefits in terms of supersonic handling and dogfighting performance, while at the same time increasing fuel capacity by 2,200 pounds in each wing. This massive fuel increase would have dramatically increased the range of the F-14 even more. Super Tomcat 21 would also house navigation and attack FLIR forward looking infrared sensors into the Phoenix rail fairings, given that the original oil cooling systems for the Phoenix missile that were originally housed there were no longer needed. Information from these sensors would have been fed to a brand new and thoroughly glass cockpit canopy that would display an extra wide hood, imagery from the navigational FLIR pod, information from the upgraded APG-71 radar and advanced avionics and mission computers that would have gifted the Tomcat with the most advanced avionics at the time. Both iterations of the Super Tomcat would have seen the use of upgraded GE F-110 turbofan engines which would have replaced the troubled Pratt & Whitney TF-30s. According to some pilots and ground crew, they had an awful tendency of blowing up. With these new engines, extra fuel capacity and increased wing aerodynamics, the Super Tomcat's fighter capability would have been off the charts. But that wasn't all. Included with the upgrade package were the proposed thrust vectoring nozzles, which would have taken their cues from the advanced computer systems on board, making the Tomcat one of the most dangerous and versatile combat fighters in the world, even against today's crop. Man, what an absolute unit that plane would have been. But it wasn't to be. While still active duty on Iran, even though they're running low on parts, the only remaining American F-14s are to be found at museums. A real shame, given that its counterparts in the team series, like the F-15 Eagle and the F-16 Falcon, are still in service today, both having seen massive upgrades to keep them in line with more modern fighters. The F-14 Tomcat is my favourite fighter of all time. While well, the board enjoys the love of many others of their complaints, like it being too difficult to land on an aircraft carrier compared to the dainty F-18 or its low speed flight characteristics, but all of those detractors love the speed and it is an iconic looking plane. I for one shall miss the majestic American bird of prey. And to me at least, it will always remain as the coolest thing to have ever flown off of an aircraft carrier. Hey everybody, it's the Duke. Uh, I want to thank you for watching this video if you made it this far. If you didn't, get the hell out of here. First of all, I'd like to give a shout out to John Brock and Paul Brock. Thank you so much, lads, for this suggestion. Uh, it was those guys that suggested the F-14 Tomcat. And my first video back, it was something that made a lot of sense to me. But listen, I need your help. Since I'm in a war with YouTube, I need you to like this video, subscribe to this video, or subscribe to the channel, not to the video, and share it. Pass it out everywhere. Why? Because I want to fire a salvo in the face of the YouTube algorithm, and every single one of those actions is a shock against big tech. Help the Duke go. Help me win this war. Peace out, and I'll see you in the next one real soon.